Good morning, and welcome to the First Congregational Church of Ann Arbor. We're thrilled to see you here in person, and a special welcome to those who join us online as well. A special congratulations for getting through the big house run traffic to make it here. Thank you. Uh, today is New Member Sunday, so please join us uh, for cake upstairs and for an opportunity to meet our incredible new members who we'll meet shortly in the service. Many of you know that Anne Lamont is lecturing at the Michigan Theater tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. There's a group of folks from FCC going, and the Activities and Fellowship uh, Committee is offering an optional brown bag dinner prior. So if you want to join together with a group of folks from here at FCC at 4 p.m. in the Mayflower Room for a discussion, and then you'll walk over to the theater together, know that that is open to you. Also, family camp is May 17th through 19th, and we're hoping that folks will register by this coming Friday so we have an idea of how many people to expect. Everyone is invited, whatever your family looks like, however much you are involved in the life of FCC. It's a wonderful weekend over on the west side of the state. Uh, we go on Friday, stay through Sunday, and there's more information in the weekly emails about that. This continues in our uh, stewardship month, and today we have a really special story for you. Uh, if you have not already seen them, you've received a, a time and talent form and a pledge form. Uh, this is the month to get those in. But also this month, we're highlighting impact stories of folks in our community who have really been impacted by the life and ministry of FCC. And it is with great honor that I introduce to you Sarah Livesey. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I have attended FCC since I was born. I was baptized here, I was confirmed here, and although I'm not getting married here, I'm gonna have pieces of me, of pieces of the church with me on my wedding day. Growing up, my family was really good about coming to church on Sundays. As we got older, that was not so much the case. Our attendance became sparser. Although we did not come every Sunday, my sisters and I still stayed involved. Junior high youth group and senior high youth group were, played huge roles in my life and allowed me to develop relationships with church peers that I still have today. I went to Louisiana for three years in a row on intergenerational mission trips. Senior high mission trips took me to Muskegon, Costa Rica, Tennessee, Kentucky, and even to our backyard of Detroit. My senior high leaders, Nancy, Jean, Darcy, Scott, and Bill, are, were our mentors. They embodied what it meant to serve people, to serve your neighbor. Being able to serve on these mission trips with them allowed me to learn from them. Not only did I learn how to drywall and to use power tools, I also learned grace, patience, to work hard, and most importantly, to love. To love myself, to love my friends, my family, and my neighbors. These mission trips were something that I looked forward to every summer. On these mission trips, we would build houses, clean up yards, build sheds, paint, share meals, and create memories. What these, mission what these mission trips mean to me and how they shaped me as a person are hard to articulate. I strongly believe that the compassion and the empathy for people that I learned helped, me to, helped shape my career as I'm a pediatric speech language pathologist. Another thing that church has given me is people that I can rely on. For example, Janet Allen was my confirmation mentor 13 years ago and someone who to this day I can still depend on. When going through confirmation, Janet encouraged me to be open-minded, would give me honest perspectives, and also to be brave and find a way to laugh. Like the one time that she made me eat a fish sandwich at 10.30 in the morning in Louisiana. Or the other time that we had to clean up a wood pile that was covered in maggots and had baby rattlesnakes at the bottom of it. Janet worked alongside of me to get the woodpile cleaned up and to eat her fish sandwich. <laughs> Although I didn't see Janet every day or talk to her every day, she's still someone that I can pick up with when we left, wherever we left off. Having gone on these intergenerational mission trips allowed me to have relationships with the adults in the church and made it easier to come to church and talk to them. Sometimes being a young person, talking to adults is hard but being on these mission trips made me more comfortable to come to church and to talk to the adults here. Oh, I, I had to confess to Sarah at the nine o'clock after 13 years that I fake ate the fish 
sandwich. I didn't eat it. <laughs> but the reason for the fish sandwich story is the family we had worked for all week, who had absolutely nothing, brought us these double fish sandwiches at 10 in the morning to thank us. And we were, Sarah, we have to eat these. Um, and she ate it. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> um, I just wanted to say the opportunities to mentor uh, and be involved with other generations in the church have been really important to me also. Whether you volunteer in the church school or do confirmation mentorships or join us on other mission trips or work days, the opportunity to develop relationships with um, people that you normally wouldn't interface with have just been incredible. Uh, one of my favorite memories of our mission trips together is when we always uh, slept on air mattresses in church, in churches. And um, one year in Louisiana, the girls were in one room and the women were in the next room with a door between us for our sleeping areas. And we were just lying on our air, our air mattresses, just talking in the evening before going to sleep. Lights were still on. And the next thing we know, the girls are at the door saying, can we come in and be with you? <laughs> and so they came in and flopped on the end of our air mattresses and we had a big slumber party together. And it was just the best.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship, the prayer of invocation, and the Lord's Prayer. Come, bless the Lord who guides us, whose wise teaching directs our days, who focuses and refreshes our minds at night, whose presence sustains and surrounds us here. We bless the Lord who is present among us. We will not be shaken or live in fear, but will sing God's praise and worship with joy. Let us pray. God, who shelters and encourages, equip us for the battles of life. When we desire armor, open our ears for understanding. When we want to argue, remind us that there is nothing holy about being right. May we lead and live in the light of your wisdom, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? We would like to now invite forward those who wish to become members of this church and enter into covenant with this community of faith. As I read your name, would you please step to the front? Travis Bolenbacher and Monica Branso, Bo Bonnell and Siri Ibargwen, Samantha Field, Richard Lord and Sue Jeffers, and Christine Martinez. You will also see that Jillian is included in our bulletin and she was welcomed into our congregation at the nine o'clock service. Paul was writing to the people of Ephesus as they began their journeys of faith. And he told them, you're no longer strangers, no longer sojourners, but equally citizens and saints of the household of God, that household which is built on the foundation of our apostles and prophets, Jesus being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is joined together. And so the same goes with you. You are no longer strangers. You do not journey alone. Together may we be a dwelling of God in the spirit. We have uh, some questions for you and we'll help you with responses. <laughs> Do you believe in God who calls us each into relationship and is a revealing expression of love? If so, please say together, I do. Do you promise according to the grace given you to grow in the Christian faith and to be faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, celebrating Christ's mission in all the world? If so, please respond, I promise, with the help of God. And finally, do you promise to uphold the mission of this church to be a beacon of God's love, hope, and Christian freedom, becoming a member with all of the duties and responsibilities therein? If so, please say, I promise, with the help of God. I invite you to join, to join me in the welcome of our new members as is printed in the worship bulletin. We welcome you with joy into the common life of this church. Let us work, serve, and journey forward together 
striving to create a supportive community of people committed to loving the world created by our loving God. As we receive you as new members of our church, may the blessing of God be with you all, now and always. Let us pray. Gracious God, we praise you for calling us to faith and for gathering us into this church, the body of Christ. We thank you for your people gathered here at the First Congregational Church of Ann Arbor, and we rejoice that you have increased our community of faith with these wonderful new members this morning. Together, may we live freely in the spirit, building one another up in love, sharing in the life and worship of the church, and serving the world in the spirit of Jesus. Amen. Welcome. Friends, join us in welcoming these new members. (laughs) <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. 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 We'd like to invite um, kids and youth to kind of transition downstairs, and as they're doing that, let us greet these people and one another with the passing of the peace of Christ. We gather this morning here in this sanctuary in joyful fellowship, and we come now to a time of offering when we reflect on the time and talents and treasures we have to share in our efforts to share God's love with our world and with each other. Let us do so with joy.
Let's pray. O oh God, for this community that gives so freely of their time and treasure and talents, for this sanctuary, this physical space where we come and, and share music, where air flows through the organs, or through the organs pipes and the lights are on and we join in joyful fellowship, for this place where we come and grieve together in life's hardest moments, Thank you, and thank you especially for the ways this time in loving fellowship and community prepares us to go out into the world. We pray that the gifts we give this morning help us share your love with our world. Amen.
Well, before we return to our series on David, we want to tell you about this mission trip in Detroit because it was phenomenal. Uh, we're going to show you some pictures and I'll, I'll narrate through what those are and then I'll share a prayer that guided us through the time together and then we'll invite up some of the crew to share their stories. So you can first see a little bit of what we did. This is a classic before shot. Those steps, as you can tell, are not usable at all. Uh, this is Janet going from our cut site, which was on the side of the house because there was no power on the first floor. This home had two tenants and the, the lower tenant was not living with any power. So we, we flew a, a power cord over the, the top tenant. This is our headquarters, the conference room where uh, the agency was housed. It's called After the Storm. It helped to renew um, and remediate homes in the, after the floods of 2021. Here we are having to use hand saws uh, because we didn't have power that day. The tenant was out and so we had to improvise. The hand saws still worked, as you can tell. Uh, those, the, the masonry was so far deteriorated where if you've ever built steps, you usually try to tie into the house, which we were unable to do. So some great post hole diggers sunk those two posts uh, 42 inches deep, which was no small feat. I didn't dig the post. I did drop a couple pencils in the holes once they were already dug though. <laughs> and we even got one of them back, yeah. <laughs> So as you can tell, we're, we're seated on the, the steps were stable. Uh, they've got handrails. The person that lives there and needs to get out has suffered from, um, suffered from a stroke and so he needs that extra stability in getting in and out. And that's the crew and the steps still didn't break. We put four or five of us on there. Uh, the other projects were installing these handrails. So these were smaller crews. The basement steps, which were a lot of folks do laundry and store other things, didn't have safe handrails. And a lot of these folks are, are seniors who really need that stability going down the steps to be able to use their home. That's Cheryl. She was our leader for the, from the agency. And this was the crew. Where's Janet? Janet's going to talk about dry lock because I didn't do that project. Okay. Um, we were fortunate to only work in basements that had been mucked out and mold remediated. So we went in where they were bare and ready for us to go. So we painted um, the raw concrete and waterproofed it with special substance called dry lock. You'll see, yeah, how it looks afterwards. And about six of us, six or seven of us did that project. And the dry lock waterproofs those yeah. walls, right? So if it floods again, we, they, have, they don't have to do mold remediation again because the liquid can't get into that masonry. As we began each day together, we gathered in the chapel and centered our time. And one of the things that, that helped us was um, Oscar Romero's prayer called the long view. Because when you do projects like this, sometimes it feels like you're just putting a Band-Aid on a wound that needs uh, surgical repair. <laughs> and so this prayer helped us center our efforts and I wanna share it with you now. He writes, it helps now and then to take a step back and take the long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is another way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. For no set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that will one day grow. We water the seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces effects far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything. And there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. And we are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. So let me introduce to you some of our workers wearing Detroit gear, some of them too. Come on up guys.
we're going to share with you um, something we learned, some roses, and our interpretation of the long view. And uh, I'll start. I learned that when you're doing a set of steps and the stringer doesn't seem like it fits, it is better to rotate it before you cut off the bottom of it. Every, every evening after supper, we did roses and thorns. And um, some days it was hard to find the thorns. The roses were easy to find. One, one, there's two parts to the roses. One was, it was wonderful to do these projects for people who sometimes had waited three years after a flood to get things under control at their house. And the part I enjoyed the most was spending time with the people from church who were working together. So I, I was able to join the trip on Thursday, the final day, and um, as I started paying attention to what our task was on Thursday, I was hearing about the dry lock, the dreaded dry lock paint, and I didn't quite understand it, but apparently Bill had said the day prior that dry lock was the texture of mashed potatoes. So everybody was dreading doing this paint, painting job on the cinder box. And it turns out when we opened the bucket of paint, this particular dry lock that we had secured was not the texture of mashed potatoes or that Bill's mashed potatoes were very runny. <laughs> um, but that's one thing I learned. Uh, and then, of course, beyond the, the, the meaningfulness of planting those seeds that Darcy read about in the poem is the getting to know each other and the, the small conversations in, in the car on the way there or to and from the work site or while we're painting. So that is one of the things I most treasure. We worked with an agency called After the Storm and they had the best director that we had ever worked with over all the years of doing mission trips. Um, she communicated, she deeply cared. All of her uh, case managers in the agency deeply cared. And they had seemed to form relationships with these people over the three years they were waiting for work to be done in their homes, or like the each step that was happening in their homes. Um, so they were just, you know, probably very lowly paid people that just cared deeply for these people. They called them survivors and not clients mm -hmm. because they had been through so much in all their life, and then this flood happened and just caused even more havoc that they just couldn't possibly deal with financially or physically. So uh, I just thought calling them survivors was another level of understanding and respect for what these people had been through. <clears throat> this was my uh, first mission trip and I really enjoyed the fellowship with uh, my, team, my FCC team members. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I, one of the things I was really thankful for was the uh, giving back to the city. I grew up in, I was raised in Detroit. So giving back to the city felt really good to me. Um, plus, I worked in that area. I worked at the Henry Ford Health System for years. So I was right at home right <laughs> at the, the location. Um, I was very thankful, too, for the weather. The weather held out for us because it looked like we were going to get rained out the one day. Uh, uh, Janet talked about the lady in charge, Cheryl. Um, she asked our group what was the best thing about this. And, and Janet said, you, Cheryl. You could just see the emotion. It just lifted her up. It, just, it was really touching. I meant it. That was great. A number of you have been on mission trips, and so you know what it's all about. But uh, for the benefit of those uh, who haven't or uh, are newer members, um, uh, the intergenerational trip was started in 2006 uh, in response to damage caused by national um, or natural disasters but whether it's um, uh, hurricanes in Louisiana or tornadoes in Alabama or flooding in Kentucky and now Detroit, um, the common thread is its impact on the victims or survivors. Um, the, after the shock, the initial shock, then they're um, basically um, hit with this unshakable feeling of helplessness and loss. And after we have been all or part, spent all or part of our week with them, 
then um, before we leave, they invariably try to express often with emotion um, what it means to them that someone from somewhere is willing to extend a helping hand in their time of need. And that is probably the most important thing that we do uh, out of all of the work while we're there, because we obviously can't fix everything for them. Many of them are on fixed incomes and have meager or no insurance, and so it's a waiting game till uh, someone can help them out. And, uh, so if you have any interest in attending or participating in one of the future trips, um, I can tell you that it addresses your desire and or need for service beyond self. It provides an opportunity to broaden your relationships with other members of the church with whom you, who you may know casually or in some cases you haven't even met yet. Um, so if you have any interest, uh, I would say be less concerned your age or your uh, construction skill set. Uh, focus on whether or not you are able, either because you're working and have limited vacation time or you have other um, obligations and commitments or uh, uh, whatever the reason. Um, and I think if you talk to anyone who has been on one of these trips, um, and for you to do that, uh, could I ask anyone that's been on a prior mission trip to hold their hand up for a minute? If you look around, uh, these are just a few of the members, but if you talk to any one of them, I'm sure that you will get a positive response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As we drove down Grand Boulevard and Tyreman and cut down the streets of these old Detroit neighborhoods, the mission team and I could see a remnant of what was. There were these beautiful brick buildings and architecture now boarded up and crumbling. We saw churches with windows like ours that were knocked out by rocks and broken, yet the structure still stood tall despite its abandonment. And when we looked at all that was now, it helped to know what had been. It helped us have hope for what could be. Many of you had heard or lived the stories of Detroit's heyday. Uh, both my grandparents started their young adult lives in the city and would tell me stories. My mom told me stories of special weekends where they'd go to Hudson's and if she really behaved herself, they got to have a Coke at the counter at Kresge's. She was a really young girl. Her mom and her would walk to their elementary school. I mean, Detroit was the desirable city. And why wouldn't it be? We had this rise of the middle class that happened after World War II that coincided so nicely with the rise of the booming auto industry and desperate need for workers. So the economic stability offered was enticing. And add to that Motown Records putting this city on the map culturally, people were flocking here and the surrounding suburbs. One of the things that helps in coming back to the city again and again and of doing the work to fix what we can for who we can is that we know its history. And knowing it helps us imagine and believe in a brighter future. History is our chance of not repeating the same mistakes. History allows us to have hope for what could be. In the history of King David and his pursuit of Jerusalem and rise to even more power, is important to acknowledge, because today we're going to look at his most epic moment of moral disaster. But before we get to that, we're going to look at the history of his rise to power. Last week when we met David, he was in a cave giving life to Saul, and sparing Saul's life. And today we move him into official anointing as king. We're going to start in the second chapter, second Samuel, fifth chapter. 
Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in. The Lord said to you, It is you who shall be shepherd over my people Israel, you who shall be ruler over them. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. It's quite a career. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah, which is uh, the northern territory, seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah, 33 years. The first thing that David did when he was anointed king was not to attack the Philistines, which is surprising because the Philistines are the rival of the, I mean, they fight them like 10,000 times in this book, but he doesn't attack the Philistines first. Instead, uh, he turns his sights on the Jebusites who are living in Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Well, like Detroit of the 50s and 60s, Jerusalem was the desirable city. One of the things that made it desirable is it sat on a hill surrounded by valleys. So military-wise, defensively, it was really hard to attack. The second thing that made it desirable, at least for David, was that it was on neutral ground. So David wanted to, to take the Ark of the Covenant, not the one from Indiana Jones, the other Ark of the Covenant, and he wanted to create a house for it. He wanted to have a national royal city where this Ark of the Covenant could be, could be worshipped in, in a temple. But in order to find a city, it had to be on neutral territory, I, neither Judah or Israelite territory, and Jerusalem filled that bill. Uh, there's a, we'll read this passage in a second as his kind of siege of Jerusalem. But in it, uh, you'll hear the, the phrase blind and lame a lot. It's in air quotes. So they're using it as a taunt. Uh, they're so confident of where their city is defensively that they tell David, there's no way you could enter in here. Even the blind and lame could successfully keep you and your armies out. So you'll hear that phrase time and time again. Remember, it's said in air quotes. <laughs> um, the other final desirable characteristic of the city is that it had its own uh, supply of fresh water. So it had a, a supply of fresh water from the spring of Gihon. And the way that they got that water in from the spring was through a, for the time, rather a contemporary water duct system. And it was that water duct system that David sent his army through to crawl up in order to infiltrate the city in a way that they were not expecting at all. Uh, so let's hear now the, the four verses that talk about his capturing of Jerusalem. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, you will not come in here. Even the blind and lame will turn you back, thinking David can't come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, which is now the city of David. David had said on that day, whoever would strike down the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind. Again, air quotes, those whom David hates. Sorry. Therefore, it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around from the millow inward. And David became greater and greater, for the Lord of God, the Lord God of hosts, was with him. So the next few chapters after he gets Jerusalem, um, which one side note about that, usually when people siege cities, they kill all the inhabitants. David did not. Uh, David was smart about this. The inhabitants had higher skills. They, they tended to be a, a more educated lot who had already figured out how to successfully run and sustain a city. So instead of killing them all, he employed them. He said, you guys already know how to do this. That allowed him to take that city and be successful with it right away because he already had people there knowing how to run it. Um, the next chapters tell of David's success. He beats the Philistines again, and the Ammonites and the Moabites and a handful of other kings. Uh, we're told that he appoints a council of leaders he appoints his sons as royal advisors, something that will probably come to nip him in the bud later. But he seems to have it all, right? The wealth, the family, the respect. Uh, most notably, he was beginning to fuse together some of these quarrelsome tribes. 
uh, feat that proves itself today darn near impossible. But as is the case with too many, when they get at the apex of their power, they lose sight of their integrity. They have this idea that they're invincible. Last week, we saw how David was able to turn away from the temptation to be violent against Saul, right? But there's a temptation that David doesn't do so well with. Anybody know her name? Bathsheba, I heard it, yep. You can read Bathsheba's story in the 11th chapter of 2 Samuel. But the gist of it is that David sees beautiful Bathsheba bathing on a roof, and he hasn't been told no in over a decade, so he decides against her will and her marital status that he must have her. She becomes pregnant, and in an effort to cover up his adultery, he tries a number of schemes to pin the pregnancy on her husband Uriah, who is one of his greatest generals in his army. Uh, the schemes don't prove productive, so in the end, he ends up sending Uriah to the front lines of battle where he knows he will be killed, and he is. It is a moral failure of epic proportions. And yet, I think it's this blunder that we read about in chapter 11 that makes David more real, that makes David as a king a bit more relatable. Because until this moment, David seems incapable of doing anything wrong. He is this divinely appointed, supported leader who rules with justice and integrity until he didn't. Uh, one, of the, one of the things, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back uh, to, to scripture that we didn't read yet in chapter seven. And I, I'm just gonna, I just wanna do ch uh, verse 16. So you'll hear in this God's divinely appointed power of David. Uh, he's working with Nathan, the prophet. Nathan's telling David all the things, all the messages from God. And he tells him, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. These kind of divine messages give, give David this sense of invincibility. Uh, and so when he has this moral failure and, and tries to come back from it, we've, we, we as the readers get to see whether or not he does. What comes next in the story tells us as much about David as it does about God. When humans morally mess up in huge ways, like David did, God doesn't give up. God doesn't abandon David. God doesn't smite David dead with a bolt of lightning from the sky. God doesn't even remove David from kingship. It doesn't mean the moral failure was ignored. Uh, Nathan the prophet strongly rebuked David's despicable behavior, as he should have. David himself was incredibly remorseful of it, as he should have. Uh, we'll hear some of that remorse next week. We hear it in the Psalms. He just pours out his heart over how regretful he was about these, this terrible behavior. But David doesn't give up on his country, and God doesn't give up on David. David's life from here on out didn't sail on with the ease as it did in the earlier parts of the narrative. He absolutely has some heartache, uh, not due to a punishment from God, more due to some really messy family dynamics and drama, many of which were created by David's own actions. But he continues on in, as a king, and he leads with the integrity he once had shown. Uh, he defeats the Philistines for the 10,000th time in this saga, and he closes his leadership with a song, uh, one of many he wrote, and the lyric says this. He says, the Lord lives. Praise be to my rock, exalted be God, the rock, my savior. So he worked his way out of this hole he dug himself in, and as he did, he claims that he was anchored by his faith in God. Like many here, I happen to be a Ted Lasso fan. And there's this quote from this episode that when I heard it, it immediately made me think of David and his leadership. Uh, Ted says, I hope that all of us, or none of us, are judged by the actions of our weakest moments, but rather by the strength we show if and when we are ever given a second chance. We cannot judge David only by the actions of his weakest moment. We must remember the history he came with and the strength he led with as he dug himself out of the hole he created. He wasn't a perfect king, absolutely not, but he was one of the most influential kings in the history of Israel, anchored always in the rock of his faith. 
So whether we are seeking to love a family member or a friend, or maybe ourselves, or maybe the entire city of Detroit, let us learn from David the king and the God who anchored him. May we be willing to see someone as more than the actions of their weakest moments. And may we be inspired and informed by the history they bring. And may we use both to imagine a brighter future. Amen.
please continue worship in a brief time of prayer. O oh God of every moment, today we relish the wonder of another day of being. We reflect on the journeys that bring us here. We celebrate those whose journeys have brought them into membership in FCC this morning. We pray that as a community, we will continue to welcome them and all into the full fellowship and care of our beloved FCC. We pray for those who are seeking community and connection this morning. We pray that all will find spaces that nourish, challenge, and set on a path of love. God, we thank you for those whose journeys involve service this week, hospital visits to friends, meals shared with loved ones, a day or days of volunteering in Detroit. We pray for those who still need care, for those who are sick or healing, for those who are lonely, for those who just can't seem to get a break from the burdens and oppressions of our world. And as we reflect on the story of David this morning, we pray especially for those who are survivors of sexual violence. God, we reflect on journeys to leadership and on our relationships with power. We celebrate the power of individual and collective agency and we will lament times when power is used over people to manipulate, control, and serve selfish interests. Help us be aware of our own power. Help us stay humble. Help us challenge power when it becomes oppressive. As we go forth into the world this week, open our spirits to the teachings of our faith which remind us again and again of your redemptive love. Help us know that neither circumstances, nor painful experiences, nor daunting realities, nor our own flawed behaviors, nor our own doubting or hurting spirits are beyond your unyielding and unconditional grace and love. We boldly pray for guidance as we strive to live as Jesus lived, humble and seeking, and ever manifesting that grace and love with all whom we encounter in worship this morning and in our journeys in life. Amen.
seated. My charge to you is to go from this place and remember that no person, no city, no nothing is not redeemable. Go out and be workers and don't put the pressure on to be master builders because it takes all of us. Go from this place with the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.